how can we help establish, maintain, and rescue marriages in our churches? Emerson Egrich is our guest this week discussing his transforming work called Love and Respect. You're not going to want to miss this one. It's episode 66 of the Church Leaders Podcast. Welcome to the Church Leaders Podcast, where we're helping you lead better every day. And now here's your host, podcasting from scenic Colorado Springs, Colorado, Andrew Hess. Well, thanks for tuning in to episode 66 of the Church Leaders Podcast. I'm Andrew Hess, your host, and this week we're talking with Emerson Egrich. Emerson and his wife Sarah travel the country conducting love and respect marriage conferences based on the best-selling book, Love and Respect. Emerson was a pastor for almost 20 years, and it was through his counseling ministry working with couples in crisis that he began to develop this idea of love and respect that has helped countless couples along the way. This is a conversation that will help you not only as you look to help couples in your own church, but also it'll help give you tools that will strengthen your own marriage. And now, here's our conversation with Emerson Eckridge. Well, Dr. Eggridge, it is such a blessing to have you as our guest on the Church Leaders Podcast. Thank you, Andrew. I've been looking forward to it. I have as well. Dr. Eggridge, you are w- very well known for your popular book, Love and Respect. Take us back to when you first started dreaming about this book. What was it that kind of led you to serve so many couples in this way? Well, actually, I pastored for nearly 20 years in East Lansing, college town, uh, the philosophy ministry I came in under was I was to study the Bible 30 hours a week for the teaching ministry there. And uh, I discovered something in Ephesians 5.33 that really kind of took my breath away because I hadn't paid attention to it. And there we read, uh, God commands the husband to love his wife and the wife to respect her husband. And this would have been in 1997, 1998. And I realized the idea of respecting a man... <laughs> was not particularly popular, and women say, I don't feel any respect for him, you know, be hypocritical for me to show respect when I don't feel it, I'm not going to be a hypocrite, he's not superior to me, he's not inferior to me, he hasn't earned it, he doesn't deserve it, I'm not going to give him license to do what he wants, I'm not going to lose a sense of self and identity and set the feminist movement back, I'm not moving back into male patriarchy and fearing male dominance, I'm not going to subject myself to emotional abuse, I'm not going to come in with pom-poms and just worship him. But other than these things, Dr. Emerson, I'm really open to hearing what you have to say about this. And that was kind of the the mantra that I began to hear from women. They were not mean-spirited, but the idea of respecting a man gagged them. And so I realized we had a huge disconnect between what the Scripture was saying and what uh, you know the culture was saying. And then I realized, though, that there was a, an innocent mistake many couples were making, that when a wife feels unloved, she tends to react in a way that feels disrespectful to her husband. And when a husband feels disrespected, he ends up reacting in a way that feels unloving to his wife. And that's when I had the illumination about what I call the crazy cycle. Without love, she reacts without respect. And without respect, he reacts without love. And then without love, she reacts, and this baby starts to spin. So it really wasn't my goal to launch a marriage ministry, but instead to rightly divide the word of truth for my own self, my own ministry. And uh, one thing you know, led to another, and now we are where we're at. And uh, it's been very, very exciting to see the response to this simple message. Mm-hmm. And tell us about that. As you kind of launched out and began to write the book, and, and I know you do a lot of teaching and, and marriage seminars, what has been the response? Like, have, have couples, how have couples responded to kind of putting some of these pieces together? Well, those who are listening, if they've never heard the crazy cycle until just now, I'm sure they went, wow, that's us. Mm. And we all need love and respect equally. But generally, men do not lack assurance of a wife's love. Uh, women love to love. You have to wound a woman at the level of intimacy to get her to stop loving. So during conflict, men feel disrespected. They don't feel unloved. And though women need respect, if a husband continues to react in a way that feels disrespectful to her, she'll say, how can you treat me disrespectfully and say you love me? Uh, Women tend to be a little more insecure about the husband's love. She wonders, does he love me as much as I love him? These are the general broad strokes. So the true need for love and respect is equal, but the felt need is uh, love and respect based on the genders that I've just suggested. And that crazy cycle then seems to echo the experience of everybody. And they sit in our conferences, in other words, and they go, wow. I mean, they have kind of what we call that aha moment. The light bulb comes on. And one of the things that's so encouraging is that we're all in the same boat. And that gives us, I think, hope. And particularly because as, as we seek to help couples, 
who are derailed for any number of reasons, whether it's adultery or or all the list of things that we could put down on a piece of paper, it doesn't start there. I always say when Sarah and I married in 1973, I didn't say, I hate you and you hate me, so let's get married. It, it doesn't go down that way. So how do couples go from there to you know wanting to end the relationship? I say it this way. There's a simple misunderstanding. There's a misunderstanding. They get on that crazy cycle, and they're misunderstanding each other. You see, she's crying out for love, but he thinks she's trying to be disrespectful. And uh, he's crying out for respect, and she thinks he's intended to be unloving. And so we don't decode. And so one of the light bulb moments is for couples to realize, he's right, I, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Well, no, I'm not trying to be unloving. And if they're willing to go there, even though there have been some very difficult, even immoral behaviors, we're finding healing. Mm. And how do couples do that where, um, I mean, I would think that like that light bulb comes on, but then there's probably that next question of, okay, how do I begin to show love or show respect where I've been wounded and and it doesn't just naturally flow out of my heart? Well, sometimes I don't start there. I start with the idea of decoding the goodwill in your spouse. Mm. Um, It's one thing to uh, be more loving, to be more respectful, which we all agree we ought to be. But I think it begins by me trying to figure out, is Sarah really trying to, my wife's name is Sarah, is she really trying to be disrespectful? Or is she reacting this way because she's feeling unloved? And uh, it's not her intent. She doesn't have ill will. You know, some of us think we married Hitler's distant cousin because we get on that crazy cycle and we take up offense. And, and the problem is that each of us are defensively reacting due to our own insecurities at some level, but it, it, it feels so offensive. For instance, 85% of those who, who stonewall and withdrawal is the husband. University of Washington studied 2,000 couples for 20 years. And uh, 85% of those who stonewall and withdraw is the man. That's not a stereotypic comment. That's a pattern that's predictable. But the women were asked, what do you feel when he does that? And this was the word they used, an act of hostility. It feels like an act of hostility. It feels like he, he hates me. In other words, she feels unloved. Mm. But we, we know the documentation. The man's heartbeat during those conflicted moments gets up to 99 beats per minute. He's in warrior mode. They monitored him. He looks calm. He looks stoic. She looks like she's out of control, the drama queen, but she's not. She's, her heartbeats were normal, or his were going through the roof. So he, as, a, as an honorable man, and this is my research, as an act of honor, he has to withdraw to prevent this thing from escalating. So it raises the question, is it an act of hostility or is it an act of honor? It depends on whether you videotape in pink or blue. If a wife can realize and decode that he's not trying to be hateful, he's not trying to be hostile, he's not trying to be unloving. And I often say to a wife, did you say or do something prior to that that felt disrespectful to him? And almost every wife who has a photographic memory will say, yes, but he should know I didn't mean it. On the other side of the equation, the research points out that women criticize and complain. That's what they do. Apart from political correctness in the home with their husband, criticize, complain, criticize, complain. Now, the men were asked, what do you feel? It, ongoing criticism felt like an act of contempt, that she's using this topic as an opportunity to send me a message that she despises who I am. In other words, doesn't respect me. Uh, but I know, and I think most of us would concur, that women confront because they care. They, they move toward the husband out of care. It's an act of care, but it raises the question, is it an act of care or is it an act of contempt? It depends on whether you're going to videotape in pink or blue. But the man has to decode and give his wife the benefit of the doubt that she has goodwill, that she's motivated out of an act of care, not because she got up early in the morning to storyboard ways to show him contempt. And so I begin, Andrew, with the idea of trying to figure out who is this person I'm married to. Uh, Was it a bait and switch, or are they still there? Are they a person of goodwill? And that's one of the points we've made, and we didn't know how that would play in Teoria, so to speak, of trusting your spouse's goodwill. And people have said, thank you for that reminder. They do have goodwill. We're just mad at each other. So that's where I begin. Decode, decode, decode. Mm, that's really helpful, because I think a lot of a lot of the pastors and ministry leaders in our audience that are listening to this podcast right now are probably thinking about the couples that come into their office and you've been a pastor. What are some of the things that pastors need to know as they're helping couples decode, as you uh, said? Well, I think 
this crazy cycle and the system that we put together based on scripture is a simple one. And one of the things I always urge is that men uh, are not unteachable. Uh, husbands are not unresponsive, but they fear the counseling setting, though they fear with pastors less because pastors are free, and so men trust that. But men are suspicious of counseling, and they're not without justification for that. Uh, Shanti Feldhahn had done some research, and they they did a random sample. Houston, out of Houston, decision analyst out of their secular group, researched uh, some stuff that was very important for the American male. And they did a random sample of the American male, 400 men, and they ran it again because they were blown away by the, the findings. But one of the questions that Shanti asked was this, uh, would you men rather be left alone and unloved in the world or be viewed as inadequate and disrespected by everyone? Again, would you rather be left alone and unloved in the world or be viewed as uh, inadequate and disrespected by everyone? Well, pushing almost 80% of the men said they'd rather be left alone and unloved. Wow. Well, Shawnee and all the women were saying, well, we can't comprehend that. That's just that's mind-boggling to us. Well, because God made us differently. Jesus said, have you not read you made them from the beginning, made them male and female? We're not wrong. We're just different. We're pink and blue. And men serve and die for issues of honor. That's not a narcissistic, egotistical attitude. That's a basic human need that we have. Uh, we're not asking anybody to respect behavior that's not respectable. We're talking about the image of God within us, that we need to know that you believe in us, believe in our spirit, that you honor us. For who we are as a human being, apart from our performance, just as a woman needs to be loved for who she is apart from her performance. But what happens in the counseling session, and it can happen here with pastors, is that if we say to the man, you know, Harry, I really find that you're inadequate as a husband, and I really don't respect you. And furthermore, your wife is feeling very alone and very unloved. Well, Harry's not coming back again. And then we have the audacity to say he's unteachable. But that's comparable to saying to, to Mary, Hey, Mary, you know, um, we don't do things politically correct here. Your husband is feeling very inadequate and very disrespected, and therefore we're going to tell him to leave you alone and not love you. Well, we would say every woman in the world would be up in arms. But we don't bat an eye, Andrew, of being able to say to a man, you're inadequate and we don't respect you because your wife is feeling unloved and alone. We wouldn't even hesitate in doing that. And the problem we're up against is men don't cry. They get angry and they withdraw and they stonewall, so they just don't come back. And then we claim that they're arrogant, egotistical, unteachable. And because they don't put a voice and vocabulary to it, because they don't go on a talk show and cry, then there is this silence that's there, and we have not interpreted what's going on in the male soul. So one of the things I say to pastors and professional counselors is, make sure that you do not send a message to that husband that you find him inadequate as a human being and don't respect him as a human being, because you're going to lose his heart. God did not design him to hear that message. That doesn't mean you can't say that what he did was inadequate, that what he did wasn't respectable. He'll probably agree with you. But the important thing is to understand how to deal with a husband and wife who show up in our office and make it male-friendly. The women will show up because they want that emotional support and they want the third party to speak into their husband's life, particularly if he's a male. She'll show up because she wants that. She has a felt need for that. But he does not have a felt need to be shamed. And so that would be the first thing I would say. And then secondly, it's a simple concept. Go over the crazy cycle and ask them if it makes sense. And from that point on, you're going to probably have the man very engaged because, one, he doesn't feel ashamed, and also he doesn't feel overwhelmed by the complexity. Women are in tune with the nuances. Men are pretty straightforward on some of this. And when you give them a simple little thing like the crazy cycle and say, gentlemen, if you just kind of hear me on this point, everything's going to be okay in your marriage, and reassure them. Mm, that's really good. And I think that I, I love that, that it's decoding more than what you can do. Are there practical things that a pastor can tell a, you know, a wife or a husband, like, here are some proactive things that you can do as you are also decoding? Mm -hmm. One of the things that you can say to the man and the woman before you speak, ask yourself, is that which I'm about to say going to sound loving or unloving to my wife? And if I can't answer that, do I have enough courage to ask her? And one of the things that we need to realize is that 
the reason couples get in conflict is very rarely about the issue, uh, the topic. In other words, people say, you know, if we didn't have money problems, uh, we'd have a great marriage. If we didn't have the sex issues, we'd have a great marriage. If we didn't have the children's disobedience issues, we would have a great marriage. All of those are real issues, but they're not the root issue. And all the research points out is that it's our unloving and our disrespectful reactions to each other while we're addressing those matters that deflates the other's spirit. So, you know, if he says, did you spend that $500 again? And then she shuts down and walks off because she's deflated. He thinks, if we didn't have these money problems, we'd have a great marriage. No, 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 no. It's your unloving reaction that deflates her. Or, you know, he says to her, can we be sexually intimate tonight? Is that all you ever think about, you animal, you beast? Sex, sex, sex. And he shuts down and walks off. And then she said, you know, we didn't have these sex issues. We'd have a great marriage. No, no, no. I mean, he doesn't want to be told no. But it's the disrespect. It's the contempt. It's calling him an animal. These are the things that devastate the male spirit. So here's one of the challenges, then, is say to them, hey, that what you're about to say, is it going to come across disrespectful to your husband? Is it going to sound disrespectful? Here's the deal. You can say anything to anybody if you say it respectfully, just as you can say almost anything to a woman if you say it lovingly. The problem we have is how we deliver it. You know, it's that whole idea, I can be right but wrong at the top of my voice. So one of the things that I coach people on is how you deliver your message. And it's not the problems that you're having. It's how you're solving those problems that create the problem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm sure that a lot of pastors, they face, you know, sometimes you, you have a couple in your office and it's like they're dealing with some communication issues or challenges, but then there are some times where there's been huge sins or, or big, you know, real big things where, you know, where somebody's felt very unloved or very disrespected. How does a pastor kind of work these things where it's kind of just like the couple doesn't know if they if they even want to do what you're talking about? Well, you have, uh, you have adultery, you have betrayal. So a lot of times you're going to have people in our offices who have just gone through that kind of a situation. There's the innocent victim and there's the remorseful offender. And how do we deal at that crisis moment with that situation? And I think, again, you know, most pastors are wise enough, they've been through this enough that, you know, you've got to, you know, if you don't know them, you've got to win their hearts over, they've got to trust you, and there has to be an empathy for both. But at some point, you know, I take the position that uh, they didn't get to that place uh, just immediately, and it goes back to the crazy cycle. They got on the crazy cycle first, and that's how they got derailed. And one of my goals always is to get them back on the rails by understanding the dynamics of love and respect. But if there's been betrayal, now you've got a whole series of issues. You've got issues of forgiveness. You've got issues of reestablishing trust. And I think most pastors are aware now there is a process involved. And when there's a serious crisis like adultery, I have a rule of thumb um, and that is it. This is going to take almost uh, for every year of your marriage a, a month. Uh, you know, this is going to take to work this through. Patterns are there and so on and so forth. But I'm a, a tremendously optimistic that relationships can be restored given that there's mutual understanding. And one of the things that we say today is the key to marriage is communication. Well, that's not really true. If I speak perfect Spanish and you speak perfect German, I mean, we can talk at each other almost poetically in our prose, but that doesn't mean it's going to get through to each other. You've got to know each other's language. And we've removed the respect talk from the male. He's not permitted because he's labeled narcissistic. And so one of the things that I will work with on that couple is for them to begin to understand what each his deepest need is. She needs love. He needs respect. And the key to motivating another person is meeting that person's deepest need, especially during these crisis moments. But they have to decide, do they want to move forward in that relationship? And are they willing to do the work? But I've encouraged them. You didn't get here because you didn't know how to do these things, but I do think you got derailed. So I give them hope and take them back, and I let them know that they can come through this because thousands of couples have through what we've done. I give them a lot of hope. You can make this. You're going to have some ups and downs. There's some serious stuff, but if the two of you are willing to seek forgiveness and to forgive and begin to do the work on reestablishing trust, you can make it through this. In fact, you can be the better for this, and there are thousands of couples that would give testimony to that effect. 
I like that and that always holding out hope because I think a lot of times couples in those crisis moments feel like we're never going to get back to happiness. So what's the point? But I like extending that. Like, no, couples have walked through similar things and, and been happy again. Talk to the pastor who is kind of wondering, maybe he's been working with a couple for a while and feels like, man, I, I think they might need some professional help or like to, to go to a professional counselor. How, how does a pastor you know, make that recommendation or know if, if this is something that, that might need some you know, more training? Well, first of all, um, Dr. Doherty out of the University of Minnesota, who that's the premier institution that trains a marriage and family therapist who become academics. It is the Harvard of marriage therapy, said that most uh, marriage uh, therapists or counselors today are destructive to marriages. They, they, counselors are toxic when it comes to helping marriages because they do what we call pathology. They end up focusing on the person who is most weepy, who is most expressive about their hurt. In almost every case, it's going to be the female. So what they do is they focus in on the female, and the man is sitting there with his arms crossed. So one of the things that I point out to pastors, you cannot send them to someone who doesn't understand how to do a fair and balanced approach in marriage and not buy everything that's being said right off from one individual, that you've got to be patient and work with both individuals and help them decode. Because I take the position that most often both have goodwill, they just have an honest misunderstanding. But you can't just defend one against the other. It isn't going to work. So if a pastor is going to send them to somebody, he needs to know that they have a fair and balanced approach. And candidly, that's not happening. But given that there is an individual out there that he can turn to, then it is simply an issue where he has to decide, is this over my head? You know, is this beyond my pay grade? I'm not able to really deal with this. Most pastors, though, can deal with it. I think it really becomes an issue of their time. That This is too much for them. They're free, and if they've got you know, five, seven, eight couples who are turning them because it doesn't cost anything, then the pastor's overwhelmed. I believe, and I have a great deal of confidence, that pastors can do the job. It's really an issue of time management, and that's really the issue. And I think we need to exalt pastors more and honor them more. I think the real challenge to many pastors, though, Andrew, is their own marriage is struggling, and they're feeling like hypocrites. And many who have been listening to this are realizing, my wife and I are in the crazy cycle, and it's a secret. And there are many people in the ministry who turn to me, and I think we all are concerned that there is this secret life going on. And I would challenge the, the person who's listening right now with, hey, you've got to apply this yourself. Let's trust that God's using this very message to speak to your own heart. You're on the crazy cycle. You're feeling disrespected by your wife, for instance. You resent her that she's not honoring you. She's not honoring perhaps your call. She's complaining and criticizing about not having enough, and she's upset about whatever, and, and you know she's taken maybe a bad attitude toward the church because people pile on you, and the only person you have to share with is her. So she has a truncated view of what's going on, and she's now harboring resentment about the mistreatment that's coming to you, and you feel caught. You know, you don't have anybody you can turn to, and the person you do turn to is no longer as supportive, and so you're quiet, and guess what? You're, you're an accident about waiting to happen, whether it's coping through an affair or uh, pornography or, you know, we just know a well-known pastor in America who was drinking over consuming, and uh, his board warned him several times, and he could not stop. He's an alcoholic, an addiction. And so we need to take this as a wake-up call and, and believe that the Lord is graciously whispering, you know what, this is a wake-up call. I need you to do what you need to do in this marriage. You don't need to resent your wife for coming across disrespectfully. She's insecure. She needs your love. She looks to you as the spiritual leader. She's reacting this way because she thinks you can take the hit, and she's relying upon your manliness to coach her through this. And it's not fair to you, but that's the challenge that's being extended to you. And what's amazing to me is that many men who are listening to this would die for Jesus Christ in a heartbeat, but you can't take the hit that your wife is bringing to you without pouting, without getting angry, without just doing whatever you do. And my word to you is you're bigger than that, and I'm going to ask you to take the hit, be the spiritual leader. If you can die for Jesus Christ tomorrow, you can certainly deal with this situation with your wife. You're on the crazy cycle. She's not mean-spirited, nor are you, but there's an honest misunderstanding. 
That's so helpful. And I'm really glad that you uh, took the time to address uh, our audience directly. For the pastor that feels like, man, when this type of stuff happens, it has to be kept a secret. Like there's nobody in my church that I can talk to about this. What counsel would you give to a pastor who feels like, man, I just have nobody to talk to and I don't want to share, I don't want to kind of air out my dirty laundry publicly? Well, we all know Corinthians where Paul says, is there not a wise man among you? And he was talking there about the Christians going before the secular courts and having the judges settle issues that the believers should have, you know, settled among themselves. But I love that question. Is there not a wise? It's a rhetorical question. In every congregation, there is one couple. There's one couple that are godly, that are wise, that are humble, that are confidential, that are not gossips, and who would love to serve their pastor by hearing their hearts. And uh, that couple is there, and that couple cares, and that couple will take whatever that is said in that session to their grave. They won't say boo to it, unless it's, you know, you're, you're um, involved in bank robberies, you know. <laughs> but the point is that uh, it, this is an issue of pride. It's an issue of pride. And what you're going to have to do if you really need help, and you know, I mean, you can go somewhere. I mean, the problem is, you know, many pastors tell me they, they can't go to any counselor around because the word would get out. So they have to drive two hours to some other place, and that becomes unrealistic. But you know what? There's usually that godly wise couple. They're prayer warriors. They care. And here's the deal. You think, well, they're not necessarily feeling competent to maybe help us. Yes, they are. And, it, and here's the deal. There's nothing new under the sun. The issues that we struggle with don't need some psychiatric you know, uh, assessment. It's pretty simple. And, and what we have found, and I always remember Swindoll saying, observe behavior changes. Observe behavior changes. Just bring it into the light with a couple like that will take you 90% uh, down the thing unless there's something, you know, unless you're a drug addict or there's something other than that. I think you're tracking with me. If it's an interpersonal conflict that you're having with your wife and, and, you, the, and it's a habit, you keep doing it, you know you're smart enough to stop it and you know what the issue is, but we, we keep it quiet, well, then turn to this couple and get some accountability here and, and you will be so encouraged and so glad you did this. It'll take a weight off your back. Because here's the deal. You can't continue to be a hypocrite, and it's killing you, and you know that. But also, we need the body of Christ. We preach this. We preach it, but then we, don't, we never do it ourselves. And so we need to put ourselves in a position where God honors us, and he will honor you. He will honor you. This is not a shaming he will honor you, and you're going to have some of the best moments of your life as you sit around that table with that couple and uh, six months into this thing laughing and carrying on and saying, why didn't we do this 10 years ago? Well, Dr. Egger, it's such a, a blessing to to hear all the wisdom that you're sharing, and uh, thanks so much for being here. Your book, Love and Respect, has touched countless couples and helped them in their own marriages, and we'll link to that resource and uh, any other places where um, where you have resources in the show notes for this episode. So thank you so much for being with us today. Well, thank you. In fact, on that point, our Facebook has about 2 million followers now, and my son and I have a podcast. He's a clinical psychologist, and uh, um, we've had about a million downloads here in the last several months. And so this is all free information for the pastors as well as uh, for the people they're ministering to. And you can go to loveandrespect.com, L-O-V-E-A-N-D-R-E-S-P-E-C-T.com. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks again to Emerson Eckridge for joining us this week as our special guest on the Church Leaders Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, take a few minutes to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes, and consider sending this episode to someone you know who might need the, the wisdom that was provided in it. Also, make sure to download the show notes for this episode and every episode at churchleaders.com forward slash podcast. In the show notes, we always include resources mentioned in the show and links to some of our guest top content on churchleaders.com. As always, if you have ideas for how we can improve this podcast or guests that you'd love to hear us interview, email us at podcast at churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next week. You've been listening to the Church Leaders Podcast. For articles, videos, and free resources that will help you lead better every day, visit our website, churchleaders.com. Thanks for listening.